Reading for I Met You in a Story, 2nd Edition, Bob Jones University. The story is taken from Misty of Chincoteg by Marguerite Henry, illustrated by Preston Gravely, Jr. In the book, Misty of Chincoteg, two children named Paul and Maureen want very much to have a horse of their own. The following story, taken from that book, tells how Paul and Maureen try to make that dream come true. The Straggler Pony Penning Day always comes on the last Thursday in July. For weeks before, every member of the Volunteer Fire Department is busy getting the grounds in readiness and the boys are allowed to help. I'll do your chores at home, Paul offered Maureen, so as you can see that the pony pens are good and stout. Paul spent long days at the pony penning grounds. The pens for the wild ponies must be made safe. Once the phantom was captured, she must not escape. Nothing else mattered. Paul and Maureen Beebe lived on their grandfather's pony ranch on the island of Chincoteg, just off the Virginia shore. Across a narrow channel lay another island, Assateg, which was the home of the wild herds. They were said to be the descendants of a bunch of Spanish horses off a Spanish galleon, which had been shipwrecked there several hundred years ago. Once every July, the men of Chincoteg crossed the channel to Assateg and rounded up wild ponies. They swam them across the channel to Chinoteg to be sold on Pony Penning Day. Paul and Maureen had gentled many a wild colt, but just as the colt was learning that they were his friends, Grandpa Beebe would sell it and the children would never see him again. They had earned a hundred dollars to buy a horse of their own, and the horse they wanted was the Phantom. This was the mysterious wild mare about whom so many stories were told. None of the Roundup men had ever been able to capture her, but this year Paul was old enough to go with the men, and he was determined to get her. When I do, he said. I'll tie a rope around her neck to show she's already sold to us. The night before the roundup, Paul and Maureen made last-minute plans in Phantom Stall. First thing in the morning, Paul told Maureen, you lay a clean bed of dried seagrass. Then fill the manger with plenty of marsh grass to make Phantom feel at home. Oh, I will, Paul. And I've got some ear corn and some lasses to coax her appetite. And Grandma gave me a bunch of tiny new carrots and some rutabagas. And I've been saving up sugar until I have a little sack full. It was dark and still when Paul awoke the next morning. He lay quiet a moment, trying to gather his wits. Suddenly, he shot out of bed. Today was Pony Penning Day. He dressed quickly and thudded barefoot down to the kitchen where Grandma stood over the stove, frying ham and making coffee for him as if he were a man grown. After a hurried breakfast, he ran out the door. He mounted Watch Eyes, a dependable pony that Grandpa had never been able to sell because of his white eyes. Locking his bare feet around the pony's sides, he jogged out of the yard. Maureen came running to see him off. Whatever happens, Paul called back over his shoulder, you be at Old Dominion Point at 10 o'clock on a fresh pony. I'll be there, Paul. And you, Paul, yelled Grandpa, obey your leader, no matter what. Day was breaking. A light golden mist came up out of the sea.
It touched the prim white houses and the white picket fences with an unearthly light. Paul lopped along slowly to save his mount's strength. All along the road, men were turning out of their gates. "'Where do you reckon you'll do most good, bub?' taunted a lean sapling of a man. He guffawed loudly, then winked at the rest of the group. Paul's hand tightened on the reins. "'Reckon I'll do most good where the leader tells me to go,' he said, blushing hotly. The day promised to be sultry. The marsh grass that usually billowed and waved stood motionless. The water of Assateague Channel glared like quicksilver. Now, the cavalcade was thundering over a small bridge that linked Chincoteague Island to Little Piney Island. At the far end of the bridge, a scow with a rail fence around it stood at anchor. In spite of light talk, the faces of the men were drawn tight with their excitement as they led their mounts onto the scow. The horses felt the excitement, too. Their nostrils quivered, and their ears swiveled this way and that, listening to the throb of the motor. Now the scow began to nose its way across the narrow channel. Paul watched the white hills of Assateg loom near. He watched the old lighthouse grow sharp and sharper against the sky. In a few minutes, the ride was over. The gangway was being lowered. The horses were clattering down, each man taking his own. All eyes were on Wow Maddox, the leader. Split in the three bunches, Wow clipped out the directions loud and sharp, north, south, and east. Me and Kim and the BB boy will head east. Wimbro and Quillen goes north, and Harvey and Rogers south. We'll all meet at Tom's Point. Paul touched his bare heels into Watch Eye's side. They were off. The boy's eyes were fastened on Wild Maddox. He and Kim Horsepepper were following their leader like the wake of a ship. As they rode on, Paul could feel the soft, sand give way to hard meadowland, then to pine-laden trails. There were no paths to follow, only openings to skin through, openings that led to water holes or to grazing grounds. The three horses thrashed through underbrush, jumped fallen trees, waded brackish pools and narrow winding streams. Suddenly, Paul saw Wow Maddox's horse rear into the air. He heard him neigh loudly as a band of wild ponies darted into an open grazing stretch some twenty yards ahead, then vanished among the black tree trunks. The woods came alive with the thundering hoofs and frantic horse calls. Through bush and briar and bog and hard marshland, the wild ponies flew. Behind them galloped the three riders, whooping at the top of their lungs. For whole seconds at a time, the wild band would be swallowed up by forest gloom. Then it would reappear far ahead, nothing but a flash of flying tails and manes. Suddenly, Wild Maddox was waving Paul to ride close. A straggler, he shouted, pointing off to the left. He went that away, get him! And with a burst of speed, Wow Maddox and Kim Horsepepper were after the band. Paul was alone, his face reddened with anger. They wanted to be rid of him. That's what they wanted, sent after a straggler. He was not interested in rounding up a straggler that couldn't keep up with the herd. He wanted the phantom. Then Grandpa's words flashed across his mind. You, Paul, obey your leader, no matter what. He wheeled his pony and headed blindly in the direction Wow had indicated. <laughs>
He rode deeper into the pine thicket, trying to avoid snapping twigs, yet watching ahead for the slightest motion of leaf or bush. He'd show the men, if it took him all day. His thin shirt clung to him damply, and his body was wet with sweat. A cobweb veiled itself across his face. With one hand, he tried to wipe it off, but suddenly he was almost unseated. Watch Eyes was dancing on his hind legs, his nose high in the air. Paul stared into the sun-dampled forest until his eyes burned in his head. At last, far away and deep in the shadow of the pines, he saw a blur of motion. With the distance that lay between them, it might have been anything, a deer, or even a squirrel. Whatever it was, he was after it. Misty Watch Eyes plunged on. There was a kind of glory in pursuit that made Paul and the horse one. They were trailing nothing but swaying bushes. They were giving chase to a mirage. Always it moved on and on, showing itself only in quivering leaves or moving shadows. What was that? In the clump of myrtle bushes just ahead, Paul reined in. He could scarcely breathe for the wild beating of his heart. Here it was again, a silvery flash. It looked like mist with the sun on it. And just beyond the mist, he caught sight of a long tail of copper and silver. He gazed awestruck. It could be the phantom's tail, he breathed. It is, it is, it is. And the silver flash, it's not mist at all, but a brand new colt, he murmured. He glanced about him helplessly. If only he could think. How could he drive the phantom and her colt to Tom's point? Warily, he approached the myrtle thicket. Just then, the colt let out a high, frightened whinny. In that little second, Paul knew that he wanted more than anything in the world to keep the mother and the colt together. Shivers of joy raced up and down his spine. His breath came faster. He made a firm resolution. I'll buy you both, he promised. But how far had he come? Was it ten miles to Tom's Point, or two? Would it be best to drive them down the beach, or through the woods? As if in answer, a loud bugle rang through the woods. It was the Pied Piper, the Pinto Stallion in command of the herd, and unmistakably his voice came from the direction of Tom's Point. The phantom pricked her ears. She wheeled around and almost collided with Watch Eyes in her haste to find the band. She wanted the Pied Piper for protection. Behind her trotted the foil, all shining and and clean with its newness. Paul laughed weakly. He was not driving the phantom after all. She and her colt were leading him. They were leading him to Tom's Point. Tom's Point was a protected piece of land where the marsh was hard and the grass especially sweet. About seventy wild ponies, exhausted by their morning's run, stood browsing quietly as if they were in a corral. Only occasionally they looked up at their captors. The good meadow and their own weariness kept them peaceful prisoners. At a watchful distance, the roundup men rested their mounts and relaxed. It was like the lull in the midst of a storm. All was quiet on the surface. Yet there was an undercurrent of tension. You could tell it in the narrowed eyes of the men, their subdued voices and their too easy laughter. Suddenly the laughter stilled. 
mouths gaped in disbelief, eyes rounded. For a few seconds, no one spoke at all. Then a shout that was half yonder and half admiration went up from the men. Paul Beebe was bringing in the Phantom and the Colt. The roundup men were swarming around Paul, buzzing with question. Beats all, he heard someone say. For two years we've been trying to round up the Phantom, and along comes a spindling youngster to show us up. "'Twas the little colt that hindered her. "'Of course it was. "'It's the newest colt in the bunch. "'May not stand the swim. "'If we lose only one colt, "'it'll still be a good day's work.' "'The men accepted Paul as one of them now, "'a real round-up man. "'They were clapping him on the shoulder "'and trying to get him to talk. "'Ain't they a shaggy-looking bunch?' "'Kim Horsepepper asked. Except for Misty, Paul said, pointing toward the phantom's colt. Her coat is silky. The mere thought of touching it sent shivers through him. Misty, he thought to himself wonderingly. Why, I've named her. He looked out across the water. Two lines of boats were forming, a pony way across the channel. He saw the cluster of people and the mounts waiting on the shores of Chinoteg, and he knew that somewhere among them was Maureen. It was like a relay race. Soon she would carry on. Could I swim my mount across the channel alongside the Phantom? Paul asked Wild Maddox anxiously. Wild shook his head. Watch eyes is all tuckered out, he said. Besides, there's a tradition in the way things is handled on Pony Penning Day. There's mounted men for the roundup, and there's boatmen to herd, and across the channel, he explained. Tide's out, he called in clipped tones. Current is slack. Time for the ponies to be swimming across. Let's go. Suddenly, the beach was wild with commotion. From three sides, the roundup men came rushing at the ponies, their hoarse cries whipping the animals into action. They plunged into the water, the stallions leading, the mares following, neighing encouragement to their colts. They're off, shouted Wild Maddox, and everyone felt the relief and triumph in his words. Trouble and Triumph On the shores of Chincoteg, the people pressed forward, their faces strained to stiffness, as they watched Assateg Beach. Here they come! the cry broke out from every throat. Maureen wedged between Grandpa Beebe on one side and a volunteer fireman on the other, stood on her mount's back. Her arms paddled the air as if she were swimming and struggling with the wild ponies. Suddenly a fisherman looking through the binoculars, began shouting in a hoarse voice, A newborn colt is afraid to swim. Wait, a wild pony is breaking out from the mob, swimming around the mob, escaping. An odd murmur stirred the crowds. Maureen dug her toes in her mount's back. She strained her eyes to see the fugitive, but all she could make out was a milling mass of dark blobs on the water. The fisherman leaned far out over the water. It's the phantom, he screamed. The people took up the cry, echoing it over and over. It's the phantom, she's escaped again. Maureen felt tears on her cheek and impatiently brushed them away. The fisherman was waving for quiet. It's the phantom's colt that won't swim, he called out in a voice so hoarse it cracked. The phantom's got separated from a bramfire new colt. She's gone back to get it. The people whooped and hollered at the news. The phantom's got a colt, they sang out. The phantom's got a new colt. Again, the fisherman was waving for silence. 
She's reached her goal, he crowed. But the Roundup men are closing in on her. They're making her shove the goal in the water. Look at her. She's making it swim. Grandpa Beebe cupped his hands around his mouth. Can the little feller make it? He boomed. The crowd stilled, waiting for the horse's voice. For long seconds, no answer came. The fisherman remained as fixed as the piling he stood on. Wave after wave of fear swept over Marine. She felt as if she were drowning. And just when she could stand the silence no longer, the fisherman began reporting in short, nervous sentences. They're halfway across. Wait a minute. The coal. It's been sucked down by a whirlpool. I can't see it now. My soul and body. A boy's jumped off the scow. He's swimming out to help the coal. The onlookers did not need the fishermen with the binoculars anymore. They could see for themselves. A boy swimming against the current. A boy holding a colt's head above the swirling water. Marine gulped great lungfuls of air. It's Paul! she screamed. It's Paul! On all sides the shouts went up. Why, it's Paul! Grandpa leaped up on his mount's back as nimbly as a boy. He stood with his arms upraised. His fists clenched. God help ye, Paul, his words carried out over the water. You're almost home. Grandpa's voice was as strong as a tow rope. Paul was swimming steadily toward it, holding the small silver face of the colt above the water. He was almost there. He was there. Maureen slid down from her mount, clutching a handful of mane. You made it, Paul! You made it! she cried. The air was wild with whinnies and snorts as the ponies touched the hard sand, then scrambled up the shore, their wet bodies gleaming in the sun. Paul half carried the little colt up the steep bank, then suddenly it found its own legs. Stout shouts between triumph and relief escaped every throat as the little filly trotted up the bank. For a brief second, Paul's and Marine's eyes met above the crowds. It was as if they and the mare and her foil were the only creatures on the island. They were unaware of the great jostling and fighting as the stallions sorted out their own mares and colts. They were unaware of everything but a sharp ecstasy. Soon the phantom and her colt would belong to them, never to be sold. Dodging horses and people, Grandpa Beebe made his way over to Paul. Paul, boy, he said, his voice unsteady, I swim the whole way with you. You're the most wonderful and the craziest youngin in the world. Now get home right smart quick, he added trying to sound stern. You're about done up, and Grandma's expecting ye. Marine and I'll see to it that the phantom and her colt reach the pony pens. 